Hello and welcome to this episode of the Burns Guide. Today we'll be looking at one of Burns' most famous poems, To a Mouse. First we'll read the poem, then analyse it by looking at the poem's craft, context and resonance. We sleek at cowering, timorous beastie, oh what a panic's in thy breastie. Thou need na start a war so hasty, we bicker and brattle. I wad be laith to run and chase thee, we murder and paddle. I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes thee startle at me, thy poor earth-born companion and fellow mortal. I doubt na whiles, but thou may thieve, what then, poor beastie, thou mun leave, a dame and icker in a thrave's a small request. I'll get a blessing with a lave and never miss it. Thy wee bit hoosie too in ruin. It's silly was the winds are strewn, and Nathan knew to big a new ain of foggage green. In bleak December winds ensuing baith snell and keen. Thou saw the field laid bare and wast, and weary winter coming fast. And cosy here beneath the blast thou thought to dwell, Till crash, the cruel coulter passed out through thy cell. That wee bit heap o' leaves and stibble Has cost thee mony a weary nibble, Now thou hast turned out for all thy trouble, But house are hauled, To thole the winter's sleety dribble, And cranruch called. But missy, thou art no thy lane, and proven foresight may be vain. The best laid schemes on mice and men gang after glee, and lee us nocht but grief and pain for promised joy. Still thou art blessed compared with me. The present only toucheth thee, but och, I backward cast my e on prospects drear, and forward, though I canna see, I guess and fear. Looking at the first stanza, we can see that Burns uses the standard habi. This is a very common form in Scots poetry and was used extensively by one of Burns's favourite Scots poets, Robert Ferguson. It uses an AAA, BAB rhyming scheme with the shorter B lines helping to punctuate the verse and the end of each stanza completes the sentence or idea. As we will see, the poem shifts between Scots and English. In the first two lines, Burns vividly paints a picture of this we, or small creature, so minute and fearful. He uses diminutives like beastie and breastie throughout the poem, which help to endear the mouse to us. Immediately, he establishes that the narrator is sympathetic to the creature's plight and means no harm to the mouse as he would be laith or loath to kill her. In the second stanza, he switches from Scots to English. It helps to create a tonal shift from the friendly and endearing to the sincere. It also marks a shift that suggests Burns is now speaking to us as a reader as well as the mouse. Burns is truly sorry that he has broken the social union between them. He even goes so far as to put himself on the same level as the mouse when he reminds us that they are both earth-born and mortal beings. In the third stanza, he shifts the tone back into Scots. He tells the mouse that he doesn't doubt that whiles, or sometimes, she may thieve. What then, he asks, thou mon leave, you must live. It's important to note that for Scots speakers, thieve and leave would be a full rhyme. He then uses the most coarse Scots in the whole poem when he says, A daemon icker in a thrave is a small request, an odd ear of corn. Burns says he'll never miss it, he's blessed with the lave or the rest of the corn. He is pictured in this stanza the life of poverty the mouse now faces without its property, surviving on charity whatever she can steal. In the fourth stanza, he turns his attention to the wreckage of the house. The winds are strewing its walls, 
and Nathan knew to big a new ain, to build a new one. New, in Scots, rhymes with the parenthetical two in the first line of the stanza. Burns uses sibilance to evoke the harsh December winds the mouse must now face. December winds ensuing, baith snell and keen. In the fifth stanza, Burns paints a picture of the desolate fields and the impending doom of weary winter. He contrasts this image with the cosy dwelling the mouse has built. The exclamation of the crash in the middle of the line helps us to feel the speed and suddenness of the disaster, and the brutality is reinforced with the repetition of the harsh k sounds in cruel coulter. Sympathy is further evoked in the sixth stanza when Burns remind us of the industry and sacrifice the mouse has made to build this humble home. Her life was already hard. Her nibbles were weary, yet she went without them to build her nest, and now she has nothing to show for all her trouble. Burns reminds us of the severity when winter features again, this time its sleety dribble, and the evocative Cran Ruch cold. In Cran Ruch, we can almost hear the ice crystallising, and the alliteration of the harsh k sounds emphasises the biting cold. Again we see a diminutive in Moosey, which furthers the tenderness shown to the mouse, and a familiarity by this point in the poem. He tells her that she is not alone. Once more, he unites the two species, in his famous phrase, O mice and men, which gave the title to Steinbeck's novel. Both mice and men are capitalised, and given equal status, as we saw in the second stanza. Burns informs us that even our best laid schemes can leave us with nothing but grief and pain. The final stanza shows us the mouse's salvation. However bad her situation may be, she is blessed as she only lives in the present, whereas the narrator and humankind must look back on misfortunes and look on in fear. The ominousness of the final line leads us into the context section of our analysis. The poem was written by Robert Burns in November 1785. Burns was working as a tenant farmer on Mosgiel Farm in Mochlin, Ayrshire. At this time, many lowland tenant farmers were facing eviction in Scotland as the landlord sought to improve the land in order to yield greater crops and profits. The old system of farming in Scotland, called Runrig, produced at best only enough to support the local farming communities or firm tunes. Famine was a constant threat for the nation. This outdated system was swept away for a new, improved form of agriculture. Farms were being consolidated into large enclosures with better drainage, fertilisation and crop rotation. Fewer people were therefore needed to work the land and many of the firm toon communities disappeared. Most people were able to find work in the towns and cities, which were going through a rapid period of industrialisation. Thousands more emigrated overseas. However, many struggling farmers faced destitution if they were evicted from their homes. Burns' own family faced this fate only two years earlier, as his father fought an exhausting legal feud with their landlord, who refused to pay his share for improvement works on the farm, claiming he was owed unpaid rent. Burns' father William won the legal battle, but was so weary from the affair that he died shortly afterwards. Poverty would go on to play a prominent role in Burns' poetry. Within the space of several decades, Scotland went from being a predominantly rural society to being one of the most urbanised societies in the world. This period is known in the nation's history as the Highland and Lowland Clearances. The agricultural revolution which was taking place can be seen in a broader context as a move towards large-scale capitalism. The Scottish philosopher and economist Adam Smith had only recently published his seminal inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations in 1776. It pondered how countries generate wealth. The wealth of nations advocated a free market economy over mercantilism and introduced concepts like gross domestic product or GDP, specialisation, and the division of labour. This work had a profound effect on shaping the world economy we live in today, and Burns's generation was one of the first to feel the effects of it. 
Around the time Burns wrote to a mouse, he was familiarising himself with another of Adam Smith's major works, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, in 1756. This was a philosophical work which looked at where we, as human beings, derive our sense of right and wrong. Smith argued that humans are self-interested, but that we are fundamentally social beings. We want to be approved of by the society we live in, and therefore learn our morality over time from living in that society. It is from our social nature that we learn what is good and what is bad. He asserted that humans have an inbuilt mechanism to that purpose called sympathy, which connects us with others and allows us to experience the joy and pain of others. You can see how the poem To a Mouse has many layers. On its surface, it is simply about the tragic incident of the nest of a mouse being destroyed and Burns, the farmer, feeling sympathy for this poor creature who now has nowhere to spend the winter. On another level, the poem is about farming communities who are also experiencing eviction as the metaphorical plough of agricultural improvement uprooted them from their home, forcing them to leave the land and sometimes the country in order to survive. On an even deeper level, Burns touches upon issues that were in their infancy in 1785 and have now fully developed into existential global concerns, namely capitalism and its encroachment into nature. Capitalism is perpetuated on growth. By necessity, man's dominion continues to plough its way through the land without a care for the social union of fellow mortals. Perhaps this best laid scheme of man has gone awry to leave us nothing but grief and pain for promised joy. However, As Burns informs us, our fellow creatures are blessed because they live only with the despair of the here and now, leaving us as individuals and as societies to look on into the future, to guess and fear.